I'm Yuval. Thank you so much for staying up so late. I know it's hard after lunch and everything. Um, as you can see from my colors, I'm from Yahoo. Uh, I don't know if you know, Yahoo is very uh, strong about fitness and healthy life. So can you please stand up? Yes, you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Everybody. OK. Um, if you're using, if you're, I, I know this, this will look strange on the video. You can cut this out. You won't see anything. Um, if you're actually using today Scala in production, you have Scala code r running in production, can you please sit down? Thank you. If you're right now using Scala in a system that is not yet in production, but is your main business. I mean, it is the product you are working on. Please sit down. If you're playing around with Scala, doing your pet projects, trying something which is not the main objective of your company, can you sit down? If you're thinking of using Scala one day, <laughs> heard about it, thought about it, you may sit down. <laughs> if you're standing, <laughs> you're not in the right place. OK. So roughly speaking, half of people here are using Scala in some way, and the other half is thinking about it, which is normal, which is basically what I expected. There are a few that are actually using Scala today. There is one that is actually using Scala today in production, naturally from Wix. Um, the, you're the only one from Wix here, I guess. OK, so they, they, they didn't hear me. Um, so what, what we're going to do, um, I'll talk a bit about our experience in Yahoo, in Yahoo Tel Aviv with Scala, and specifically with integrating Scala and Java, which, and, and the, the pain points we found and the things that we learned the hard way in order for you to uh, save some pain when you do it, if you do it. Um, this is going to be technical. I am a technical person, and we're going to see code. Not a lot of it. Feel free to ask questions, even if it's questions about Scala syntax or what this is in Scala. OK? It's OK. So um, I'm Yuval Sapir. I've, uh, I've I'm, I'm a Java programmer. I've been programming Java since 1996, not the 60s, the 90s, uh, which was Java 1.0. I remember Java 1.2 coming out, and it was a thrill, and then a few other versions. So I know Java. Um, I, I currently work at Yahoo Tel Aviv. Um, I'm a member of the Garage Geeks core team. I don't know if anyone heard about it. Of course you did. And I'm one of the founders of Game is. Game is the Israeli Game Developers Association. And I'm really a newbie in, Java, in Scala, sorry. I'm really a newbie in Scala like, I guess, most of you. Uh, I started with Scala a few months ago. And we decided to do our project in Scala. And from, then, from there, we ran, ran with it. And so don't ask me too complex questions. Um, Yahoo Tel Aviv is basically a startup. It's a startup that was named Dapper and was purchased by Yahoo three years ago. We still work as a startup. Uh, we are nine, 29 employees, 26 of which are engineers. We're an engineering team. And we, we are very, very autonomous. We're not very dependent on, on the global Yahoo. Um, what I want to do with you here, or what we set out to do, in our project in Yahoo is um, our project is basically very, very service oriented. We have our, the, the whole project is divided into services, into independent services. And each service has an interface that it's committed to. And other services use this service. SOA architecture, oh, SOA is architecture, but SOA. Um, so it was very easy for us to say, OK, 
we want to try Scala in this environment because we were able to take a service and say this service is using Scala. I'm, I, I definitely don't, I'm not saying this is implemented in Scala, but this is using Scala. And it's in separated enough from other services that we don't, w the other services don't notice that this is Scala. Um, so our service is basically, it's an in, it has an interface that defines it. It has an implementation that impl implements it. It has a servlet wrapper. Services communicate through HTTP. And it has a client code which makes life simpler for, uh, for the users, users of the service using this service. So we wanted, we set out to build a new service, which we call the Blender. Uh, the Blender takes, um, I'll show, I'll show a small example later, but, but basically it takes content from two sources and blends it together, creates a new list of, of content entities. So we wanted to write it in Scala. Why we wanted to write it in Scala? Because, because we can, because we wanted to do something new, and because we believe, believed that Scala is right for this specific uh, job for this specific service for building this specific functionality, but we wanted to keep current architecture. We don't. We didn't want to mix it with uh, to, to re reinvent the whole thing. We don't. We don't want um, being a large corporate American uh, <laughs> and all bad things about it. Um, we 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 need service engineers to deploy stuff to servers. We didn't want to reinvent anything. We want to do it very locally and be able to deploy to the current Java servers using Tomcat, using whole of the Java stack. And we wanted it accessible from other services. So what this quite simple service does, it gets uh, a list of content, each content items. Each content item has its data and a score. But this score is relative to this list. So if I have two lists and I want to mix them or blend them, I have to look at each score relative to the other scores in that list. OK? That's the premise. I just want to make sure that this five and this five are different, because this five is in this case, the low, low end of this list. And here, it's somewhere in the middle. OK? So we define a simple interface. It's called Blender. It has one method called Blend. This is Java, in case you were wondering. <laughs> um, it, it, has, it has one method called Blend, um, and, and which gets two collections of entities. An entity is a very, very simple abstract class, has an ID, has a score, can have, depending on the entity type, much more data than that. So first thing first, what environment did we use? What development environment did we use? We come from Java. We use Eclipse. So I don't know. I didn't ask how many of you are Java programmers, but how many of you are not Java programmers or do not know Java? OK. Um, so you know Eclipse, I guess. And Eclipse was a very easy choice, because that's what we use today. And, and it's very easy to migrate from Java to Scala using Eclipse. So what uh, I, I guess you can't see it from there. But there is a small s here, which means this project is a Scala project. We just started a new Scala project, built to source directories, one for Scala, one for Java. You can see that they use, no, you can't see, but all the other can see that they use the same package, package names in Scala and Java. And this way, it's very, very easy for us to uh, use one code from the other interchangeably. Um, I'll try to. OK, so this is basically it. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a one project that has both codes. We can use uh, project dependencies if we want to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to separate 
different codes. The users of this service use this project as their dependency, etc. So, wow, it worked. So, so um, there are other ways to do it. But if you're starting out, I recommend this this way. Just just a small tip. Um, so how does it look? I, I'm not going to go through all the code. This is color code. But basically, I have this is this is color code. Um, we have a class. The implementation class is in Scala. This is the, this is a shorter version of the implementation class. It ex extends the Blender, the interface, the interface that we saw before. It has a lot of cool Scala tricks, like uh, using fold left uh, to calculate the min and max of the list. It it uh, uses maps to uh, to calculate the new scores. It uses uh, list concatenation and then sorting to uh, to to resort the list. And then it uses map to project whatever we want. Okay. So this is uh, the, the only reason I wanted to show you this code is because writing this in Java is is not very difficult, but it would be at least twice as long and half as readable, or quarter as readable. So this is readable, right? If you know Scala. OK. <laughs> um, so, so, um, so this is why we chose to do it in Scala. This is why Scala was the natural choice for this specific service. OK? But still, um, before that, but still, we we wanted to keep the interface, the client, the server, everything around it. We wanted to keep it in Java, so we we were on familiar grounds. If si if one day we decided this is not working for us, we want to switch back to Java, we can do it very easily, and 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 also the other way around. If someday we decide we want to switch everything to Scala, still we can do it. Okay, so. The, the, um, well, the problems we encountered along the way. So I'll start with, I, I think, I don't know who's been to which talk already, but so I might repeat things that were said before. But I think the two most important things that are useful tools when you connect, when you integrate Java and Scala are these two. The, Java con the, the collection Java conversions, there was a talk two talks ago about collections. Scala collections are amazing. They are much, much better than, than Java collections. They can do amazing stuff, and, and they're good for you. They're very healthy. Uh, the, they'll um, they'll uh, get you better salaries, and I don't know, use them, OK? Scala collections are great. but. What can I do? Uh, you saw in the interface, I, my contract with, my, with the service, I get a simple Java collection. But I still want to do map on it. Okay? I still want to do all this, these crazy things. I want to fold left it. Who doesn't know what fold left is? OK. To in, the idea of fold left is this. Basically, this is a this is a sequencer, an iterator, okay, just like Java iterator. It gets an initial value and it runs this function, min max, on the initial value and the first member of the iterator, the first output of the iterator, okay. It gets a result. Then it runs this result, the, the function again on the on the result and the second member of the iterator, and so on and so on and so on. So basically, we take what we do here is we take a list and we fold it into a single value. Okay? The, how we fold it? We start with min max, which is, sorry, we start with initial, which is the worst possible. I mean, for minimum, it's the maximum value. And for, for maximum, it's the minimum value. And every time we take two of these and say, OK, I'll, for, every, for, for the minimal value, I'll take the minimum of them. For the maximum value, I'll take the maximum of them. So in this short line, I found the minimum value and the maximum value of all members of content. But content is somewhere here. 
Content is a collection of entity. This is a Java collection, Java util collection. Okay, Java util collection does not have fold left, unless they changed something in Java 7, which I'm pretty sure they didn't. So how was I able to, to do that? Since Scala has implicit conversions, and since um, this short import Scala collections Java conversions dot underscore is importing all the st all the s Java collections to Scala collections conversions. When I wrote this, it automatically took the Java collection and translated it into Scala collection. And this means that I don't have to write any code to do that. I can use the full strength of Scala collections on Java on simple Java collections. Okay? So this is this is this saves tons of time. And this is written everywhere and you'll see it. Bean property is something that um, I'll touch on later, but basically it means this member is is should be used as a bean member. I mean, getter, setter, whatever is appropriate, we'll get to that. So Scala is object-oriented. It has classes. Java is object-oriented. It has classes. Are Java and Scala classes the same? Are Java and Scala classes are the same? Anyone? Not using traits. Yeah, but a class doesn't have to use traits. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, basically, yes, a Scala object is a Java. Uh, sorry, a Scala class is a Java class, and and mostly vice versa. So, um, when we write a class in in Scala, we expect to be able to use this class the same way in Java. So, if I have, and the other way around. So, if I, I have a Java class. The, the, the easy way to see if this is Java or Scala is if it has public in front of it, it's Java. Okay? <laughs> if it doesn't, well, it doesn't. Um, so I have a flower here. A flower is a, is a simple class. It has one method, which is called what is, which returns a flower. And then I have a rose. A rose is, of course, a flower. It extend, extends flower. But since it doesn't have public here, you can guess this is Scala. And you will be right. This overrides what is by returning a rows is and the super what is, which is basically calling this. Okay, so I inherited a, uh, I inherited a Java class with a Scala class, did a call to a method from a function, from a Scala function I called a Java method, and it, it just works. Okay, and I can still do it the same way around. So this is a Java class. Red rose, which extends the, the Scala class, which is rose. I hope I didn't get confused. And calls the super what is. So basically, and we have here, I just print out the new red rose what is, and I get the red rose is a rose is a flower. Because these are all classes at the end. So this is the simple case, okay? It's going to get complex from here. But this is a simple case. You have a class in Scala, it's a class in Java. No need to worry about it, OK? But as said before, oh, sorry. You have to worry about it. Why? Because Scala has vars. It has vals, which are not the same as members in, in Java, OK? Everybody knows what a var is, what a val is, what's the difference? Who doesn't know what is a val and what is a var? OK, you don't have, OK. Var is basically a, mem a simple member, as you would expect in Java. A var e, which is implicitly set to integer j here, is a member of this class, which is just, it's just called e and it's integer. Um, val is a read-only read member. So basically, since Scala is functional and functional mostly advocates immutability. So objects should be, and I'm saying it very, very carefully, ideally objects should be immutable. Val is an immutable value. Val d equals a means that this will never change. It's somewhat like Java final, but for real, because Java final is 
I can't say it because there's camera, but bullshit. OK, the, it's not real, final, in Java. So in Scala, yes, this is, this is the real thing. And uh, it applies the same for, uh, for constructor arguments, OK? This is val b will create a member which is a val, and it's automatically initialized from this b. So I have this class, this everything class, that has from outside b, c, d, and e, which are accessible. I can, I can read them from the outside. How do I read them in Java? Because if I'll try to, to do everything dot b, I'll, I'll get an error. Why? Because Scala translates everything to a function. Okay? There, are no, no, there are no publicly accessible members. Everything is accessible through, through, through functions or methods. So if I want to see this b in Java, this is Java, I have to call the function which is named b. Okay? I cannot do this b without. That, that, would, that would be a compilation error. I have to call the function, which means that if b was defined as val, as you, can, you might remember, it has one function, b. But uh, c, which was defined as variable, which is mutable, has two functions. Sorry, c is a bad example, but e has two functions. e, which reads the e, and e underscore dollar sign eq, which is very intuitive, the setter for e. Okay? Uh, there is one way around it. As you can see, we've defined c as bean property. And uh, as I said before, bean property means this is a bean, which means there are two additional functions that are generated, which are get c and set c, which are basically what you would expect from a bean. So this, sorry, this, this unfortunate line, bean property var c equals 3, creates four functions. OK? It creates the c, the c underscore dollar sign eq, get c and set c, everything. OK? Which, is, which seems a bit over, but that's the way Scala is. And of course, it creates code that initializes it to 3 and, and everything else. So this is part of the standard. <laughs> Function or it can be changed in the future. Which one? The, this, the, the, no, the, the internal. Yeah. The inter I. I don't know. I don't know. I can check it. I don't know. So this code will perform as expected. I'm creating this everything with one and two, and then I'm reading it and get. I'm getting the right values and everything is great. But this is a bit more difficult because using Java, I expect to be able to access members, and it's impossible from Scala. The other way around, it's easier, because Scala compiler knows when you're accessing a member, it, it knows in compile time whether it's an actual member of, or a Scala member, and then it has to access the function. So you'll see many times this presentation, Moving from Java to Scala is significantly, accessing Java from Scala is significantly easier than the other way around, and that's, that could be expected. So we, we talked about, before that, because you saw the answer, uh, we, <laughs> we, talked about, uh, we talked about classes, uh, and as said, classes can have traits. Uh, who doesn't know what, what a trait is? OK. Um, Basically, a trait is some kind of behavior that you can mix into a class. I'm, for example, uh, you can define a, a certain behavior, which is a set of functions, and mix it into an, either an existing class by subclassing it, or to a new class by defining it as extending or mixing in this, this, uh, this behavior, which is, which when you think of it, it's not very different from an abstract class. Because it has a definition of functions. Some of them may be abstract, abstract. Some of them are not. So you would have expected, or at least I expected, that it would be implemented in Scala as an abstract class. What's the problem with that? 
multiple inheritance. Java does not support multiple inheritance, but you can mix in as many traits as you'd like. So the solution for that is that basically tra traits are interfaces. But they're interfaces with, with a kick, with additional pepper. Uh, so if I have this sample trait, which is defines two functions. The first one is simple function, which, is in, which returns an integer. Okay? And the second one is also it's, it's a very simple function, but this one has a body. Okay? This, this, this line would basically be translated to Java as uh, int with body, uh, empty, empty parentheses, open curly braces, return three, close curly brace, braces. Yes, this is why Scala saves you all the boilerplate, because this is shorter. So, but this is, this is basically the body of the function. But if this is an interface, where the, does this go to? Um, of course, the answer is it goes into a, uh, another class. A trait creates up to two classes. The first one is the interface. Uh, which we implement, this is Java, we implement sample traits, so we have to override both functions, simple and with body. But the implementation goes to sample trait dollar sign class, as you will see, Scala lives, loves dollar signs. There is a reason for that, and the reason is you are not allowed to use dollar signs uh, within, uh, within, Java, within Java code within uh, Java identifiers, but they are allowed on the class, the, on the bytecode level. So you, they, they, they ge since uh, Scala generates the, the bytecode directly, it uses dollar signs wherever it wants to create something that cannot be created purely by Java. So sample traits dollar sign class will hold the actual body of the function. So I can uh, what I did here is basically I mixed in this trait in Java. Of course, Scala does this automatically for me, and again, saves me <laughs> one, two, three, four, five lines of code in this very, very simple uh, example. But I can do it, or I can just ignore it and use it as a simple interface. Um, I don't have time. Um, so another very good example, uh, sorry, a very good feature of Scala is the companion objects, which are basically objects that has the same name as a class um, and have, and have uh, their own methods. This is basically a singleton, which, are, which is guaranteed to exist and guaranteed to exist only once. OK? Everybody knows what a singleton is? OK. Um, so if I have the class which has two functions, hello and world, which does the obvious, and it has a companion object that, that has two functions, one called hi, which returns hi, and one which, which is called world and returns cosmos because I want to, uh, how would this be translated into Java? So we know how this will be translated into Java and how we can access this from Java. But how can we access this from Java? Any guesses? OK, so this is, since we said this is, this is a singleton. This, sorry? There, there will be a dollar sign, I promise you. But, sorry? Um, no, this, both of these are actually compiled in a single class. That's not true. Up to here, <laughs> this is compiled into a single class, which basically takes these, w whatever is in object, and translates into static. And everything else is, well, not static. I can't say dynamic because it's not really. But what happens when there's a clash? Is world method a static or non-static? In Java, we're not allowed to have both a static method and a non-static method with the same signature. So of course, we'll use the dollar. We'll use two dollar signs. Um, one is with object dollar sign, which is basically the companion object, and module which holds its, well, statics. So 
I can actually access world by accessing with object dollar sign dot module dollar sign dot world. Um, so and this is this is the object. This is a namespace. Okay, this is a package, basically namespace. Um, so we can access everything. We would probably okay. Scala uses companion objects all over. Why do you need it? Sorry. Why do you why do we need companion objects? Um, first of all, that's the way to do static. OK, I don't have static. Because a class is a class, an object is an object. There are two different things. Uh, and, this is very, and this is very, very useful in Scala. Because for example, uh, if I want to create, I want, to crea I want a constructor which is not really a constructor. I would add a static method, an object method, with an apply. apply the apply function in, 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 in Scala is what is called when you, you don't call a function. OK? Apply, unapply, et cetera. So this is, this is a, a very use, used, uh, used case in Scala. OK? One important thing is to remember that apply is a function. OK? And it can be accessed from Java just by calling apply, because it's a function. It's a method in Java. I try to say method when I talk about Java, and I try to say function when I talk about Scala. It doesn't, I, I get confused. Stas, yes? Uh, will the ID be smart enough to parse yes. the structure? Yes. Okay. Um, everything you see here, um, good question. You know why it's a good question? Because I have an example. Um, this, is, this is rows. Is it large enough? This is rows, OK? It extends a flower. When I, I, when I try to, OK? OK? When I try to, this is, this is the Scala, and it recognizes flower from Java, OK? Um, and, and the other way around, of course. If I have in Java everything Java. No, I didn't want Scala object. OK. I can. You can look at, yeah. It, it, OK, you, you, you see, it knows it because, because the ID looks at the class file and sees it there and, and, comp and, co and compiles from there, which is basically the same class file that the ID itself created. OK? You can decompile. It's not OK. What happens is that there is no intermediate form. Scala does not create Java code and then compiles it. It compiles directly to bytecode. But you can decompile any Java bytecode and get you know, a somewhat Java source. It's not going to be easy to read. Back to Scala, I, d I don't think so. I, I, ne I, never, I don't know if anything of any such thing could exist, but it's not going to be easy because <laughs> it does some nasty tricks there. OK, so on to very, very specific, sorry, very, very specific Scala things. Um, closures, basically. Scala is a functional programming program, Ming language. And, and being a functional programming language means that, function, that a function is a, an entity in the language, a first class entity like anything else, like a class, like an object. A function is something that the language knows about, which is different from Java. In Java, a function cannot stand by itself. They talked about doing it in Java 7. They didn't. But basically, in Java, a function is, has to be part of an object, of a class. In Scala, that's not like this. That, that, it's not like this. I, I have a class which gets a function, OK? And this function should be, I should be able to pass a function to, to this function, and so on and so on. Because I, if I can pass a function to a function, I can pass a function to a function to a function and never get over with the enjoyment of it. Um, so if I have something like that, how do I call it from Java? 
basically, what happens here is what's passed here is something called function one. Function one because it has one argument. Okay, there is function zero, there's function one, there's function two, three, four, five, up to function 22. If you need a function that gets more than 22 arguments, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> okay? I don't know why they went all the way up to 22, but you're doing something wrong. Okay? So, and, and it won't compile in, in, in Scala. If you try to build a function with more than 22 arguments, it would break Scala and someone would come and yell at you <laughs> for a good reason. So, this is function one is basically a template, uh, a generics class which gets two, argument, two type arguments, the return type and the type of the first argument. Of course, function 22 gets 23 type arguments, the return type, and then all the return types. And again, don't build functions with 22 arguments. Um, so what I do is I build a new abs uh, abstract function is something that implements function and does the obvious nothing. Um, but it requires the apply method. As I said, apply is the way that Scala calls the non-existing function. It calls the empty, empty named function. And I just imp do, do my implementation here, and, and, and I can pass this, this, uh, this f which I created. Now, f is not a class. f is an object. I have just created, OK? I've just created a new class and called its constructor implicitly in Java. And um, well, not implicitly, because I called it here. Um, and, and created this object. So this is a bit wasteful. And the Scala compiler does it a bit better, but really not that much better. So feel free to do this. But this gives you the feeling of using uh, functional programming without leaving the safety of Java. You can do this at home without Scala, just pass functions to functions in Java and has, have tons of fun with it. Well, kind of tons of fun with it. Um, the same goes to pairs. I'm not sure I have. No, I don't have an example here. But there's a pair or any kind of tuple uh, tup, uh, has, again, as the same way we have function 1, function 2. We have tuple 2, tuple 3, tuple 4. I'm, I think, up to tuple 22. I'm not sure. Um, and again, if you get this far, don't. Um, which is a template class in, uh, sorry, a generics, gla generics class in Java, which you can init initialize and pass to whatever expects a tuple in Scala. Um, and if we talked about generics, uh, I think someone said before that uh, generics in Java and generics in Scala are the same. The only difference is, you said before, that the only difference is uh, curly brackets and, uh, no, not curly, uh, um, triangular brackets and uh, square. square brackets. I said it's a difference. I didn't say it was OK. <laughs> so yeah, this is, this is a difference. But, but supposedly, uh, Scala generics are much more stronger than, um, than, than, than Java. Uh, the main reason for that, in my opinion, is uh, covariance and contravariance, which I, I'll assume someone here didn't, don't, doesn't know what it is. But basically, in Java, if you have a list of class A, list A, <laughs> I have two classes, A and B. B inherits from A. I have list of A and list of B. Which one inherits from which, from whom? No one. There's no inheritance relation in Java, um, which means that if I have I have a function that gets list of A, and I want to pass a list of V. In, in functions, you, you have a way around it. But uh, I have a variable that is a list of A, and I want to pass it a list of B. I basically will have to well, coerce it on the system, and I'm using very, very mild words. 
in Scala, that's not the way it is, because, because of covariance and contravariance, I can define that if A inherits from B, then list of B, sorry, if B inherits from A, list of B inherits from list of A. Okay, this is a very, very powerful mechanism, which is, does not exist in Java. So how does it work? Um, the sad story is that, or the sad fact is that, everything you write about types in generics in Java get erased once you compile. The compiled code does not know anything about generics, okay? Which is, well, that's the way life is. Uh, the reason for it in Java is that when Java was written originally, there, were, there was no generics. And when they added it, they didn't want to change the virtual machine. So the virtual machine does not know about generics. And the only one that knows about generics is the compiler. So since Java is like that, Scala is like that too. Only the compiler knows about generics. So List of A and list of B, when I actually compile them into bytecode, they become list. So list inherits from list. There is no problem with that. Esel? Shachamesh? I'll talk slowly. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you want to use this kind of thing in Java, Remember that anything you wrote about covariance, contravariance, generics type safety, etc., gets lost. Okay? Don't expect the, don't expect to get any errors on that, and that's that's a pain because <laughs> this is this is experience talking. Be careful with that because you say, okay, I, I have a list of bees, and I try to um, I try to Pass, pass it to a list of A, and it works, because this is in Scala, this is in Java. The, com the ID has no way of knowing that this is incompatible. And then when you run it, you get, yeah, well, you know what you get. Um, so be careful there, OK? This, this can hurt. Um, but on the other end, hey, I, I can do that, so why not? Um, there was one more thing I wanted to say about generics, but I don't remember it, so, so I'll skip it. Um, operators, operators. Scala loves operator overloading. If you're writing a function and you're naming it something that only contains A to Z, you're doing something wrong. No, I'm, I'm kidding, because you, know, you can define this function, plus, which gets A as an integer and returns A. This is very intuitive, because that's what you expect plus to do, right? No? I guess it's, most people expect a binary plus. That's a unary plus. So I, uh, there is a, you, you didn't see the class, uh, the class definition here. So I, you can write that. Please don't. But you can write that in, in Scala. And what you'll get in Java is this dollar sign, because we love dollar sign, dollar sign plus. And there is a whole table of what gets translated to what. And th that's, that's the whole magic, OK? If you have a method that has the plus in it, it would, uh, it would be translated into dollar plus. If you have plus plus, dollar plus, dollar plus, et cetera. Uh, there is the whole thing of uh, left to right and precedence and using column, et cetera, et cetera. This works since in, in Java, you have to explicitly, um, this, is, this is functions, so this is methods. So you have to explicitly uh, specify the order. Okay? If, I have, if, I, if I use this plus and I want to do um, a plus b plus c, I have to do a dot dollar plus uh, b dot dollar plus C. OK, so I specified, and th this is wrong, actually, because this is the, this is the, uh, the, the, the wrong associativity. OK? But, but here I actually specified what I'm going to do. What I did is this. OK? This is, you understand this? OK, so in Scala, when you, you, when you, use, when you use right associativity, 
and, and the compiler knows itself to, to build the right order. So again, this is sold by the, by the compiler. But if you want to do it yourself, you have to be careful about that because, OK, who thought that I should write it the other way around when I wrote this? OK, it, it's, why didn't you say anything? OK, but, and uh, so the, this is confusing, and this is counterintuitive. And especially if you mix in different associativities, this is fun, different kind of fun. Question on operators? Sure. Is it possible to uh, overload the assignment operator? A? The assignment operator. Is it possible to override it? Um, it's no, it's not. No, you, you, basically, you cannot. It's, it's, it gets translated by the compiler to something which is not simply a function call. Okay, so, so the, basically, in Scala, there is no such thing. Okay, there's the, the you cannot, you cannot uh, define a, the equal sign as a function. The equal sign, no, you cannot define the equal sign. And if you try to define something like uh, plus equals, you you'll get something which is which is not what you expected. Okay, so. Um, Why you don't have, uh, let's say, i plus plus? Like in, uh, C++, like in Java, you can increment the uh, uh, integer. Yeah. Because it's not uh, bit, yeah, one it's way. Right. And, and truly, in functional programming, when you say you want to increment something, you don't want to increment it. You want to return the next value, which is basically i plus 1. Okay? Because because it's an immutable, it's it's preferred immutable, okay. So this kind of philosophy solves the problem by saying we don't want to do that, okay. And and actually, you really don't want to do that because you don't want to. Um, okay. So um, that's basically it. I I just want to go back to the example. Um, somewhere here. OK, you know what? I'll go here. Um, OK. Um, you remember I implemented, I implemented the uh, the 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 blender in Scala, which I previously, just a second. No. Um, which I previously defined the interface for in Java, and and use all these fold left uh, tricks, maps, etc. And then what I did is I wrapped it back in Java. By using a REST service, well, I, it's a bit commented out. But <laughs> basically, it's a REST service. Uh, it's using uh, Jackson specifically. Uh, and, and defining it as a web service, which is, uh, again, I could do this in Scala. But I'm used to doing it in Java. I have the tools to do it in Java. Maybe I do it automatically in Java today, so why not? And I just create a, a implementa an implementation. And whenever I get a call to blend, I pass, I pass the call to the uh, Scala implementation. OK? And this code can be and usually is automatically generated in Java, um, minus the commenting out. Um, can comment. OK. And, and it means that, that I'm using basically the same infrastructure I always had. And I'm running it on same Jackson and same uh, Tomcat that, uh, that I had. Why, why I keep saying Jackson? I mean Jersey. All these J things. Uh, sorry, Jersey. Uh, and, I, and, I, and, and, and nothing changed for me. I, we use Ant, but please don't. Um, if you. If you use Scala, if you purely use Scala, use SB, uh, SBT, uh, which is not simple, but it, it does the trick. If not, use Maven. Maven is compatible with 
Maven is great, and it, Ant, is, Ant has Ant tasks for Scala, which definitely does the trick. You can compile in Ant, and you can do everything in Ant. But you know, Ant was great in its time. Let's move on. And Maven, Maven just works with Scala because Maven works with with everything once you get used to it. Because you know, um, uh, so just build the whole thing from both sources. Pack the same, pack it into the same jar or whatever you want, and ship it away, and it works. This actually works, and and it works seamlessly. And people using this doesn't don't, don't know that they're using Scala, which is great because they might yell at us. Um, I have no time. I have a minute. Okay, questions. Quick questions. Yes. You have to include the the, the Scala jar. In yes. The yes. So they know. Okay, they can know about. Don't tell them. Um, okay, this is this is an issue. Uh, it, again, it depends on which building environment you're using because there is the fast uh, Scala compiler, the FSC, which is basically in memory and keeps everything in memory, just compiles the differences. It it helps. Um, we're a big company. We have build farms. You, you build locally on this amazing machine, which has tons of memory and tons of CPU, and, and it's OK. But once you build on a build, build farm, it takes time. But it takes time to compile Java, too. So it's more. It's more. Yes. Sorry? Yeah. But you, if you have a build farm, that's out of your scope. Uh, sure. What about the red dots and the exception box? Yes. Um, all this, all this translation means tons of objects of classes that are created and functions and methods that are created and are, and are invisible to you. And as you see, there is a dollar module dollar and stuff like that. It's not easy. Eclipse does. Uh, Bad, quite bad uh, use of it, and uh, if this this is an issue with an, with Eclipse right now, IntelliJ does better job at hiding unnecessary things from you. Still not perfect, but uh, but it's an issue. I, I I have to say it's an issue. Okay. Okay.